Good evening and welcome to the latest event in our political page turner series hosted by the Georgetown Institute of Politics and Public Service, known to many of you as geopolitics. My name is Grace Shevchenko and I'm a junior in the School of Foreign Service studying international security with a certificate in diplomacy. At GU Politics, I've had the pleasure of being the 2019 to 2020 school year co-chair of the Student Leadership Council and a member of the GU Politics cohort to the Iowa caucuses during this past primary election season, where I first had the opportunity to briefly meet tonight's special guest. And as a young woman looking to pursue a career in public service, I could certainly use some of the advice featured in our guest book. So without further ado, tonight's special guest talking about her latest book, Everything Will Be Okay, Life Lessons for Young Women, from a former young woman is Dana Perino. Ms. Perino is also the author of the New York Times bestselling book, and the good news is, Lessons and Advice from the Bright Side, a co-host of The Five, served as the White House press secretary from 2007 to 2009, and has been a longtime mentor and advocate for young women. The conversation will be co-moderated by two women who have also been mentors for young women and were Jew politics fellows classmates in the spring of 2019. Paulette Aniscoff served as the director of the White House office of public engagement from 2013 to 2017 and is currently a partner at Bully Pulpit Interactive. Antonia Ferrier previously served as the staff director of the Senate Republican Communications Center and is currently the chief strategy and communications officer at CGCN Group. Please join in the conversation by tagging geopolitics and using the hashtag hashtag geopolitics forum on social media. For those in the Zoom room, you can submit the questions um, using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Antonia and Paulette, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So nice to be here. Antonia and I are old friends now after fellowship. We can't wait to get started. Indeed. Um, Dana, it is so nice to meet you. Thank you, Paulette. Um, we've got a lot of people here uh, that are obviously looking for advice. And so I had one quick thing I wanted to ask. You've always got people approaching you uh, and do you just say, read my book now? Um, <laughs> um, but the students here are probably looking for, for advice. And when they do approach someone, tell me one good thing and one bad thing that people do when they approach you for advice. And oh, I'll that's admit, a great question. One of my biggest pet peeves is when people ask me in a long conversation about advice, a ton of information they could Google. And I'm like, yeah. you should Google that ahead of time. Yeah. And then you should ask me a nuanced question about that topic. Um, but tell me if you've got sort of a, a good and a bad way to approach someone. Um, I love this question because I think it's, it's something happened in the last 20 years where people seem to think that mentorship has to be some sort of formal relationship. And yeah. they, they, they need to have the mentor and they need to meet once a month and they need to have, and, and then if then they will have the career success that they want. And I'm all for companies or organizations having a formal mentoring program. I think that's great. But I think in the, what I try to say in the book is that role models and mentors can come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. You might even have a role model or a mentor who you've never met. And it could also be even a fictional character, um, somebody that you admire. For example, I mean, for the younger people here, um, like Madam Secretary, for me, that show's amazing. And I'm like, I wanna be like her. Um, for when I was younger, um, Sybil Shepherd in Moonlighting, for me, I was like, oh, she's a girl boss. And I really loved her. Um, CJ Craig, of course, for people in political communications, again, that was somebody who you could look at and go, wow, she's amazing. My sister, when I asked her this question, she said Inspector Gadget. <laughs> she loves that whole thing. Anyway, um, yeah, I do get asked a lot uh, for, of time uh, you know, for advice. And today for, is a great example. My day was, I've been up since 4.30 a.m., I had one hour break. I did Pilates in my office, but I had to cut it 10 minutes short so I could get onto another Zoom that I was doing with students in Wyoming. And yeah, so there's a lot of this. There are occasions when now somebody says, uh, you know, my daughter would really like some advice. And I'll say, if you could just have her read my previous book, and the good news is, had one chapter of what I thought was all my mentoring advice in one place. And I'm like, if she could read that, I'll be happy to talk to her. Just that chapter, I'm not asking you to buy the book and now you can get it like whatever, get it from the library. Well, what I find is that young women, they'll read it by noon tomorrow because they are hungry for advice. Yeah. And I love that. The one thing I find though, Paulette, is that they want us to give them a plan as well. They don't just want the advice. 
They want you to say, if you do the following 13 things, you will be the White House press secretary. And they'll do them all by one o'clock tomorrow because they are driven. They really want to succeed and we want them to succeed. I think the, one of the worst examples I have is one young woman, she impressed me and I wanted to help her. And she at, kept asking me to lunch. She's like, lunch is something I eat at my desk. It's usually a bar of some sort, or maybe a little, like, I don't go to lunch. But for this young woman, I was like, okay, fine. We'll go to the little diner downstairs. And we're eating, eating, eating. And it's taking forever. And then all of a sudden she says, so what do you think I should do? This is the general question. It's like, in your life? She didn't have a specific question for me. She was like, what do you think I should do? And I just thought it was such a waste of time that I, I didn't want to do it. I find that it's, if you are going to approach somebody that you admire, one, you could Google and go all the reasons that you admire that person. It doesn't have to be a woman, whoever it is. Think of like two or three specific things you want to ask them. You know, one thing, um, for example, I get, you get, I'm sure you get this question too, is you know, should I go to law school? Should, go to, should I go to graduate school? Like if you're, I mean, that, you should ask somebody who's a lawyer, right? Should I go to law school? What do you want to do? Like all, there's all those questions. Um, so I think having something specific to ask is really good. And then also being respectful of their time. I used to find that I could get so much done in 10 minutes from the White House South Lawn when I got on Marine One to, from the flight to Andrews Air Force Base or what do we call that? Joint Base Andrews now? That's a 10 minute flight. If I was on the flight with President Bush, I could get everything I needed in 10 minutes. So that part of the book, I also talk about managing up. Um, mentoring up is another way. Like what's the best place to, to ask somebody? If it's, a, if it's a really busy woman and she's trying to get towards a kid's soccer game, you might say, would you mind if I walked with you to your car this afternoon? you know, and use that time really wisely. That's why we started Minute Mentoring because a lot of these questions can be answered pretty quickly. And I'm not against a longer meeting, but I just think efficiency of people's time and respect for that is really good. Um, there is so much from this book. I just, again, I, meant, I mentioned before we all started that I feel like I'm still working on the financial piece of my life. Uh, that is true. There are so many pieces of, of, of just really helpful advice. There was an anecdote you put in about, about Condoleezza Rice and, and she went out to Stanford, which sort of flows into what Paulette was just saying. Just, you know, what is it that you want to do? You've got to figure that out yourself. So in your life, Dana, you have so much sort of perspective on where you, where you ended up, but you also seem like you were flexible in thinking about it too. So as you were mentioning, just a lot of young women going to you, them wanting the plan, how do you mm -hmm. sort of tell them to take it a little easy on themselves? Well, okay, that's so funny because how do I know that they all want to plan? One, because they, like, they'll tell you. And I'll say, <laughs> yeah. well, you know, the first thing you should do is you know, sign up as an overnight country music DJ, and then you can figure out how to uh, become White House press secretary because that's what I did. But how do I know that? It's because I'm a planner and I'm a worrier. Firstborn daughter, terrified of disappointing anyone. Yeah. Uh, my mom used the gold star on the chart uh, yeah. method with us. My sister could not care less. I'm like, I would do anything for a gold <laughs> star. Like the worst thing that would ever happen to me would be to get a Pinocchio from the Washington Post. Like I'd rather die than have that happen. Um, and then I, I always had ambition. I remember when I was around um, 15 and... Um, I just witnessed something in my family where somebody wanted, a woman wanted to buy something new and the husband uh, was super negative. And I thought, I don't want anyone to ever tell me what I can't buy, can or can't buy. Like, that's never gonna happen to me. Um, and I knew I wanted to go into media. So I started doing all these things. Well, then I ended up going to Washington. That's kind of a, I, I explained it in the book. It's kind of a long story, but. The reason I say everything will be okay is that even though I'm a planner and a worrier, when I look back at every career advancement I had, it wasn't something I planned. Well, that's what I think is interesting. You also, you ended up in San Diego. I had no idea you ended up moving to Britain. I mean, this is one of these things for a lot of young women or young people, 
think that there's going to be, they can sit at the age of 18, 22. And I hope all of you that are out here listening to Dana's advice know that Dana went and lived in Britain for a year, you know, mm-hmm. moved to San Diego. They moved into an apartment with her husband. They only had a mattress. I mean, <laughs> and now we have Dana Prino. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's, I just think for a person who's as well planned as you are and have you and know, I really you know I, I just um like I remember when I when I decided to leave Denver to go and work for Congressman Scott McKinnis of Colorado I thought I'll never get to work in television and then when I left Capitol Hill I said well now I'll never get to work in Republican like big time Republican politics. I moved to England. We moved to San Diego and there I wanted to work for President Bush so bad. At the time he was still a candidate and they called me from the Bush campaign and they said, would you be willing to be our volunteer spokesperson in California? But Peter was just starting a business and we had the benefits through my employer. So I had to turn it down. It was Mindy Tucker that called me and I hung up and I cried and I said, well, now I'm never going to get to work for George Bush. And then 9-11 happened and I moved to Washington and I was a spokesperson at the Justice Department. And then I went to the White House Council on Environmental Quality. And in January of 2005, I thought I got my dream job. It was all I ever wanted, the deputy press secretary job. I was very happy to be behind the scenes. I love the deputy job. I always take the deputy job, no matter what. It's when you, you work holidays and weekends, but that's when you get to know the boss and you figure everything out. And then I'm doing the deputy job and I'm like, well, no, I kind of like learned that job. And we had 18 months left to go. And I was like, you know, maybe Peter and I should have some time back together. And we decided I would leave the White House. And I went into the White House that morning on the Monday, uh, intending to resign. And I sat down to say something. And Ed Gillespie said, do you mind if I go first? I was like, oh, no, fine, go ahead. And he said, the president would like to announce you as the press secretary on Friday. And I was like, oh, great. Okay, what do we need to do to get ready? But inside I was like, what did this happen? And I knew I was gonna have to call Peter and say, uh, yeah. But also I knew that my life had just changed dramatically. And I was up for the challenge. I knew I could do the job, um, but that was just another moment. And the same, and now, so I won't go through all of the changes, but every single time I wasn't planning to move to New York to work on the five. And now that's the longest I've ever held a job. We're going to have our 10th anniversary in July. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's, but that's good advice to be able to roll with it, you know? And I think that's really good advice for everyone to have. I totally agree. And I, I just have to add to that and say, I actually see so much risk aversion and unwillingness to take any sort of zig and zag um, with really ambitious young people. It's like they, they feel like there has to be a plan laid out that they can follow. And I, I think the most interesting careers, the most interesting people, that's just how it went. I mean, very few people wake up, want to be a press secretary and take every step they can to get there. And um, You won't get there. You won't become yeah. the press secretary if you do that. <laughs> Agreed. Um, so President uh, Bush used to give a speech all the time. He would say that one of his worries for America was risk aversion. Yeah. And that one of the things that we need in our society is for people to take risks, whether it be in your own community, like maybe you want to start a nonprofit for your um, area, or maybe you want to start a business, or maybe you just want to take a trip around the world. Um, or like for me, I met my husband on an airplane and he was British and he was older than me. And like, well, what was it? and now we've been married uh, 23 years this September. Um, and when I started, uh, I started with a PR firm right out of the White House as I was signing the contract, I knew it wasn't going to be good, a good fit, but I thought that's what you do. Yeah. And about eight months later, I had to go to Dallas uh, to see the president. We were going to work on his book. And I walked in. The first thing he said, not even hello. He said, what's wrong? He's like, oh, nothing. I'm fine. He's like, no, I can tell. And so I told him, like, oh, the PR firm, blah, blah. And he said, well, why don't you start your own business? Why don't you start your own PR firm? And I had about 12 reasons why it just wouldn't work. And he said, yeah, I'm not persuaded by that. He's like, let's just ask yourself a question. What's the worst that could happen? And he made me tell him, like, what's the worst? So I say, and he goes, okay, so you're telling me that the worst thing that could happen is you start your own business. It doesn't work. And you have to work for another PR firm? 
that's the worst thing that could happen to you. It's like, I'm not persuaded. And he was right. And I started my own business and it went very well. And then I ended up moving to New York and forgot the business. But I, I say in the book that when you are fearful, if you are, first of all, if you're born in America, you already won life's great lottery. Amen. If you are an educated woman in America, you're in the driver's seat. So the only thing you really have to decide is how hard do you want to work? What do you want to do? And make good personal decisions and then everything will turn out okay. Absolutely. Amen. It may not just look like you thought it would, but that doesn't mean it won't be great. Exactly. Um, one, one thing I have to ask you, because I think it comes up so often as I'm talking to young people and it came up in many different ways in that list of questions your dinner guests posed. Um, there were so many themes of different versions of work-life balance. And that one just feels like such a common theme when, when we're talking to people. And uh, I actually think there might be some generational differences with this one too. And some things that the three of us might agree on that, that might surprise people, but um, would love to hear your take on work-life balance and, and just hear a little bit about how you think, and if you agree there's a generational difference that, that I see, what that might be. I think there's such a generational difference. Someone told me today they were taking tomorrow off for the masters. I was like, oh, are you going? Like, no. <laughs> so watch it from home. <laughs> and then I admire that. I'm like, damn, I should take a day off once in a while just to watch something. Um, <laughs> and it's a weird thing. And this part of the thing I talk about in the book is these like generational differences are very interesting. Um, most people now are either working for baby boomers or Gen X. And that's why I, I, I say that everybody listening and watching this, you have to watch the main Gen X movies of our, of our youth or you will never understand us. Reality you have to watch Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Reality Bites. The Breakfast Club. Yep. Yeah. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Yes. Correct. Um, Pretty in Pink. Uh, and coming to America, number one, not number two. Oh. Although, cause I love that one, but it is a very interesting generational thing. And this issue of work-life balance, I actually think that Generation X could learn something from younger people about this because yeah. here's the thing, like for us, we were latchkey children. Kids today would have no idea what happened. Like no one was home. We had keys, and let ourselves in and took care of ourselves from three to 6.30 until our parents got home. And my parents had no idea what test I had the next day. They didn't know what my homework was. Like nothing, I, am, I admire my friends today. They know everything that's going on with their children. Like the chemistry test, they can call the teacher, they know all these things. I'm like, wow, my parents had no clue. Everybody turns out okay, it's just a generational thing. But I think the work-life balancing, I learned something at the Bush Center. Um, they have a program called the Oh gosh, the Presidential Leaders Scholars, Presidential Leadership Scholars. And I went there and I was listening to a question about work-life balance and how do you handle it? If you're going to work in public affairs, uh, like a lot of people here on this, um, participating in the Zoom might, you know, the hours are hard and they're long and they're unpredictable and everybody's willing, like your competitors, the people that you're like, or your, your colleagues and your competitors, they all are willing to work a little bit harder. So you can worry about getting burned out. I just feel like they're so worried about the burnout before they even start working. Then I'm like, it's not, you're not going to die if you work 12 hours a day. You're just really not going to. But this woman that I worked with at the National Security Council, she said during the five years she worked in the Bush administration, and she worked in National Security Council, she was assigned to Iraq, that she missed every birthday in her family, every big family event, every big thing. She missed it all. She said, but I knew it was temporary. After the White House, she is a professor at Harvard. I think she's written two books. Now she has two little children. And she said her work-life balance is great now. And she said the way to think about your work-life balance might not be week to week, but over the course of your life, over the course of your career, and I really, I thought, oh, that's something that I could do too. Like the, a, a, just a different way of thinking about it. Because I, I say in the book that there's a, um, 
a book I really recommend for people in their 20s. It's called The Defining Decade. It's by, uh, uh, I guess, a social psychologist, a workplace psychologist um, do named Dr. Meg Jay. She's at UVA. And she's talking about how your 20s, that's the time you have to really work hard and really invest. Like a lot of people might say, eh, I'll get to that in my 30s. But her point is that you actually, if you put in the work in your 20s, you'll have a better work-life balance later on. So I would probably say that when you're in your 20s, you probably aren't thinking about it like that, but that's a totally fair, fair point. Um, you know, there was a, something that struck me reading um, one part of your book, which is about listening. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of noise out there right now, not even just right now, where we are in sort of society so much talking, um, and you talked a lot about listening. Um, and I think that's such an important thing for people to, to hear and understand. I'd love you to talk about that a little bit more. Sure, so uh, as I wrote this book um, on the weekends during the pandemic, um, I was thinking about who are the people that I admire the most, right? And, and Charles Krauthammer, the late Charles Krauthammer always comes to mind. And for those of you who might not have known his work, I, I highly commend his book, Things That Matter to You. Um, he's a syndicated columnist, but also definitely Google him and, and read about him. And so he was a columnist, syndicated columnist, and also um, a communicator. Uh, I, I'm looking up at the TV, it's not even on. Um, he was on uh, Fox News for many, many years as part of the all-star panel at the end with um, Brett Baer. And he was extremely effective in his words, but he didn't really say that much. And I started to think back, like, why was that? And I realized it was because he listened so much, quietly. And because of an accident, he was in a wheelchair. So, you know, there was a way for him to, he was settled and he would listen. And then he would destroy your argument with five words or something, five words or less, you know, but uh, I, of course I exaggerate. And I thought about that, I'm like, an active listener will do a few things. One, your boss will notice and they will appreciate it. Your colleagues will know it, notice and they will respect you more. If you find also that not only are you having a hard time listening, but that you also tend to interrupt a lot, I don't think that young people realize just how much they interrupt. There's a little uh, trick that I learned from a friend of mine who works in intelligence he said that one of the things he found is that listening obviously is so important, but that because he's thinking ahead and he's smart and he's efficient, like he would tend to try to finish the sentences of the younger analysts. And he realized that that was actually a really big problem because what if they were gonna say something he didn't know, or what if he chilled their reaction like and, and chilled them to speak. So he, his trick is that when, some, when he's in a meeting, somebody else is talking, he holds his, um, his, hand, his finger right here over his mouth. And it's just a little reminder to him to let the other person finish. And the last thing I would say on that is, I also don't think that we realize how much we interrupt younger people. And I'll just give you this example of a young woman. We were at a dinner, a friendly dinner. Um, my friends have one young daughter. She was 13 at the time seeing, uh, and she's an only child. So she would come with us to everything. She was at the dinners and everything. She always at the adult table. And there was one night we were having a conversation about some sort of public policy issue. And I could tell she wanted to say something. So I said, well, please go ahead. So she started to talk and she's 13 and she's got her glasses and she's really trying to articulate herself and she's thinking it through. And damn if every guy in, at the table didn't try to finish her sentence for her to help her along. And I watched and I watched it and I, I'm usually not like this, but I, I hit my hand, I slammed my hand on the table. I said, let her finish. She's going to be interrupted by you guys for the rest of her life. Just give her this one moment. <laughs> I just was so mad. And I'm really like, wow, maybe I'm thinking of myself, but I would say that like the, the listening, it will help you get the job you want, the promotion that you want um, or the respect that you want in the office, but it also can then help you be a better leader because it makes sure that you're allowing other people to communicate. My last thing on that is Dick Cheney in the White House, he was always very quiet in meetings. He would ask like maybe one or two questions and they would be the hardest questions that no one had an answer to. And one time I asked him about his approach 
And he said that in the Ford White House, when he was the chief of staff, he saw that if he said something in a meeting to kick things off about how he felt about an issue, nobody else would talk. Mm. So as a leader, be thinking about that. Like maybe there's a time for you to just wait and listen and absorb before you talk. Good advice. I feel like I'm talking a lot though. <laughs> well, like you're, you're supposed to be talking, right? Yeah, those are yes, I think so. <laughs> Uh, one story that I really loved that uh, relates to a topic that I thought would be good to bring up uh, is your Berlusconi story. Oh. <laughs> and um, I would love you to tell us a little bit about that story and talk about how to make mistakes gracefully because we're all going to make mistakes. And I think that we don't talk about that enough. We make mistakes all the time. And when you're in the big leagues, the mistakes are in front of a lot of people um, and people remember them. So I just wanted to hear a little bit about making mistakes. Sure, if, uh, Mary Haynes, who is a part of IOP, of course, she'll probably remember this story. Um, it was July of 08, uh, the White House was preparing to go to the G8. Um, we were very, very busy. And anytime we went on a foreign trip, I think we went to like 52 countries in that last year. Anytime you went on a trip, you the National Security Council Communications Office would put together this binder and it would have all this information about who's going to the meeting, what are the topics, um, what is the agenda? And then you would get like some background information on each of the countries or the leaders and the leaders, because that would help the reporters that when they were getting up for their morning shots, you know, their live shots back home, you know, they could go through this book and have some information just to like help them out a little bit. And I never thought about how these books got put together. And there was this one woman who was, had been very ill. And I found out that that was her job. Her job was to put the books together. And she'd been very ill. And she was just back to the White House. And my colleague said, oh, don't worry about the books. Like, we'll do them. And then she insisted. She's like, this is my job. I'm going to do it. So I was, I was like, I don't care. That's fine. Great. I don't have time to worry about that. So the books get printed. We're, we fly over to Tokyo. And then I think we went up to some other place, um, maybe Kyoto or something. And the meeting's all happening and we're on, uh, uh, um, on a mountaintop and it gets fogged in. And when I say fogged in, it was like, like the window had white butcher block paper. You could not see for three days. And we get there and the books are all out there. And Prime Minister Berlusconi, uh, Bunga Bunga, look, you can Google that one too. He was kind of a wild guy out there on the world stage so to speak, and Italian and uh, effusive and emotional and all of those things. So in the book, what you were supposed to do is take the official leader page from their website, their company, their company, their uh, country's website, and put that in the book as their bio, bio. But what happened with the Berlusconi one, for some reason, is they didn't take the official countries, but they took the Wikipedia page of Berlusconi. So it said at the very top, it said, loved by some, but hated by many, comma, Silvio Berlusconi, blah, 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 blah. And this is an official US document that has gone at the binder. And I hear about this and I giggled. I was like, oh God, that's bad. I'm like, who's gonna notice? And then I found out the deputy chief of staff was so angry and mortified. And I was like, well, we got 20 crises today and that's a really bad one, but there's another one <laughs> that I got to deal with too. And so I was, I, I apologized, I apologized to the president. And right before a di the, one of the first dinner, I was in the room waiting, I'm going to brief them before they see the press and Berlusconi bursts in and he had his arms open real wide. Remember my last name is Perino. And he says, Dana Perino, don't worry, it's all true. And he gave me a big hug. And I thought that's a way that a leader can take the sting out of something, right? He knew that he was had this reputation and I'm sorry for this sunlight, but I don't know what else I can do. Um, it seems like it's going down. He, he basically what he did was in front of the president and the chief of staff, said, I don't care. Let this one go. It's fine. Now, because he did that, I was also able to let it go. So sometimes when you're in a position of leadership, 
find the way to forgive someone else. Or let's say it's a colleague who had a bad day, terrible presentation, didn't get the business, lost the bill, didn't get the votes they thought, whatever it might be, screwed up the, co the copying at, at the FedEx um, office, whatever it might be. If, if someone's having a bad day, like, it's like, really, what is the worst that could happen? Like, was that that, is it, is it really a big deal? You might ask yourself, like, we're not trying to solve world peace here, although we were at the G8. Um, but that was, I always thought about that, that Berlusconi was so generous to do that in front of everybody. And it's something I took away from that, but like, try to do that as well, pass it on. I don't know if we have time for one more question from Paulette and I. I have one, which is kind of hinted at this a, a bit in the book, which is about women and managers. You, you wrote that they, we have a reputation of being poor managers. And I read a piece in the journal about a year ago about why typically why men do better um, and sort of end up in more managerial positions. And it's that men have a tendency to delegate more and women try to hold on to too many things mm -hmm. um, that we try to do too much because, and we're pretty hard on ourselves, um, or at least I am, I think you are yeah, as well. Um, but mm -hmm. just one, just some observations on that and trying to let go and, and build out teams and learn to trust people. Because I mean, the one thing I'll just share with everyone that I also work on is to make sure that people that I work with feel like they have a voice in, in the process and that's a good way of managing and making sure that the team works well. So just your thoughts on that. Well, I think that one, I think there's a cliche that women don't make good managers. Um, if you are a young person and you're going to enter the workplace, don't let yourself fall into the trap of repeating that cliche. Uh, there are good managers and bad managers. Some are men, some are women. It doesn't, it doesn't matter the gender. Um, I also think that now just the way things are, are working in the workplace, um, there are more man women managers than ever before. And uh, I think that is obviously a good thing. And you have to also think about, well, something that I did, because I, I was worried about this when I became White House press secretary and I was looking for some sort of a guide that would help me. And there was a book written by, I wish I could remember. Well, I remember the title, I don't remember their names. They run a PR firm up here in New York and it's two women. And it's called How to Be the Boss Without Being a Bitch. And I was like, okay, I need to like, what's that about? Because I can get a sharp tone um, and I have a White House voice, my husband calls it. <laughs> I don't use it very often anymore, but I used to use it uh, a lot. And part of that was just, I had a, a huge amount of responsibility and I would think about my, um, how I was, uh, being perceived by people. And I saw a story in the book about this young woman who is, works in cybersecurity in the government. She works at one of the agencies and she's quite senior, but she's only 30. But she's the only one who knows how to do the cybersecurity stuff that they need. And she had been working there about three weeks and the, her first week was there was a huge problem and she had to try to fix it. She call, contacts me and my husband, Peter, and she says, have you guys ever had a situation where you're managing people that might um, think that you're not quite up to the job? And I feel like I'm rubbing people the wrong way. And I think they don't like me. And I think that women and men need to remember that there's a difference between being liked and being respected. So I asked her, I said, when you work to solve the problem, did you, first of all, did you solve it? Yes. Uh, and did the, your supervisors recognize that? Yes. Is there anything that you would have done on the policy side that you, that you would change now? I like, no. I'm like, so is, is it in your approach, the way that you communicated, could you have done that better and maybe been a better listener at the time? She said, yeah, I maybe could have done that. I said, well, just remember, I said, you're brand new. You're 30 years old. We're in the middle of, the, we're just beginning the pandemic. And there was a major cybersecurity issue that you had to solve. Are you worried about being liked or about doing the job well? And it's just, all of us want to be liked. That's human. Um, it's what they say in, in Washington, get a dog. Um, or as Krauthammer said, get two in case the first one turns on you. Um, but that's what I think. There, there, there's just a difference about be, between being liked and being respected. And if you can find that uh, line 
and hopefully you'll also be liked, but being respected is first and foremost, the most important thing. Well said. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanna make sure that the students get some opportunities to ask you questions. And the first student that we've got ready to go is Sabrina. Hi, Dana. Thank you for being here and presenting. My question is, what key takeaways do you have for young women in a career transition? So I'm a former TV reporter. I worked at NBC Chicago, and I'm moving into public relations and communications. I'm also actually, WCIA TV was my first TV station, and I'm a University of Illinois alumni. Wow. Yeah, the last small world there. Burn the tapes. If they ever find them, I would die. <laughs> I'd rather have a Pinocchio than them find the tapes. Um, so I, I have in the book um, a, an example of something that I did when I made a big career decision, and that was um, called the whiteboard incident. And I listed, my husband had me do it, all the things I wanted to do in a job and all the things I didn't want to do in a job. And we assigned a numerical value to those things. And when you added it up, it was very clear I needed to make a change. And it sounds to me like you've decided to make a change, right? You are moving into this new career. What's so exciting is that you are bringing to your new career all of this experience from something that everybody in PR wants to know how to do. Like, how, do you, how do you work with a reporter? What does a reporter need? What is a journalist looking for? How do you make it compelling? Why would you call her and bother her with that? I get pitches that are hilarious. I'm like, are you kidding me? I have no time for this. I'll just delete lots of them. Um, but you, you already have this built-in advantage. That's an, you have an amazing asset. So think about it that way. You're not starting from the bottom. You're coming into something new with something that many people in PR don't even have. So think about it that way. All right. Thank and you. Next up is Rachel. In thinking about work-life balance, do you think it's mostly about personal choices that we each make, or is there a role for public policy in creating a better work-life balance for women? Ooh, that is a great question. You know, I'm really worried about what we have gone through in this past year for women. Um, so many women have left the workplace because they had to in order to help take care of the children uh, while the schools were closed or while there was a hybrid uh, system. And, something like fewer women are working today than in like 30 years ago. Um, now we can get everybody back at some point, but in terms of a public policy position, getting the schools open would be the first thing in order to help women get back to work. Um, I also think that there might, there might be something to be said about um, you know, childcare and childcare tax credits, things like that, where you're actually able to help women who, and it doesn't even, I'm talking about, mothers now. And I really, I don't have children. So um, when I think about that issue, I'm like, well, it wouldn't necessarily help me, but it would help so many of the young women that um, I know that are trying to, to make it work. But I do think it's mostly a personal thing. Um, I, in fact, um, had a really interesting thing happen, Rachel, just as soon as my book was went to print. And I'm feeling like, okay, everything's settled. And I am going to put this book out in March and it'll be great. And at the end of December, right before Christmas, I got a call asking me to, well, asking, <laughs> I don't know if I got asked. <laughs> I was, I, I had the opportunity to move uh, from doing two to 3 p.m. and the five to moving to the nine to 11 a.m. shift plus the five. And it was a great opportunity for me to move to the morning hours and to work with my co-anchor, Bill Hemmer. But my physical schedule got completely thrown up in the air. And I swore that after I worked at the White House, I would never get up for anybody again every day in the four o'clock hour. Well, guess what? Now I'm doing that again. And I have lots of opportunities and lots of friends. People want to get together and everything. Well, my day, I can't even explain how crazy it is. Back to back to back to back. I, you know, I finished the five, I made it home, I got on the Zoom and I, and I have a call at 3.30 and then blah, blah, blah. And it was just, it's, all this stuff. And I had a mini meltdown last week. And I was mad about everybody asking me to do things. Kind of mad. And I realized I'm mad at myself. And that I needed to take my own advice because the only person that can deal with my schedule and my work-life balance problem is me. And that's what I write about in the book is that you have to take responsibility for it. There has to be some discipline. And I'm gonna to have to say no to some things. And I will tell you that um, 
I have a friend who's, the pandemic's kind of helped me in a way because everybody was coming to New York. They wanted to get together all the time. And I felt really responsible that I needed to get together with people and see them. And of course I wanted to see most of them. And then all of a sudden, as soon as the pandemic happened, the, it was like the best thing that happened to me because then everything got canceled. And I was, it was like forced work-life balance. Like I was done at six o'clock and it was joyous and I loved it. And I've realized that how quickly I come back to the city, we start working here and now I'm right back in the soup again. And that's my fault. So I'm trying something new between now and Memorial Day. I'm gonna see how it goes. Uh, I won't reveal it, but that was, that was my personal choice. And I see that in my friends too. If you start to get frazzled, there's only one person who can really deal with that. And, and I don't think, I think public policy could maybe help around the edges, but it actually I really just think it's a personal decision. We've got another question coming in from Paulina next. Hi, thank you so much for being here to speak to us. I'm a huge fan. The Five is my favorite Fox News show. Oh, great, thanks. I grew up on the channel. Um, my question is regarding cancel culture, particularly it's increased prevalence in both academia and in um, the workplace mm -hmm. and pretty much everywhere. Um, yeah. I know personally, I've been interning at the Federalist for almost two years and I am very careful in which rooms and around who I say that aside from on a public Zoom call. I know you are. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm cautious about it. It's yeah. wonderful, but I know that some my association with a conservative place will brand me in certain circles and I know a lot of other young conservatives are forced to sort of try to decide how much they want to protect themselves and how much by playing down their political beliefs and how much they want to be true to themselves. What advice would you give to people on how to handle this tension and how to find a way to be true to themselves and with, but also how to be safe? <laughs> So um, I actually think, Paulina, I, I totally hear you. And I know that this is an issue for conservatives, but I don't think it's only an issue for conservatives. I have a feeling that there are a lot of people that might have very left-leaning views that they're afraid to talk about in public too. So I think first recognizing that it's not just happening on one side is really important. And plus it's happening to people um, who might consider themselves very liberal, but they are getting canceled or fired because of something they wrote when they were teenagers. And of course, we're talking about Alexi McCammond here. And if the Devil Wears Prada couldn't handle protecting her new editor at Teen Vogue, I, mean, I, I just don't know what's going on. This is the hardest question I get during this book tour is how to deal with cancel culture. There is a couple of things I would say. One, I read a book when I first got to Washington, D.C. called What I Saw at the Revolution by Peggy Noonan. And it was about her time as a speechwriter for Ronald Reagan. And I remember reading that and thinking, oh, oh, it's okay to think like this. It's, I, I'm not like some crazy creature. Um, and I realized that there were just more people than, um, than not, but also that I could just be true to myself. And I don't have to own anything anybody else says. Um, I just own my own comments. So there's that. Second, I do think that um, I, what I want young people to know is that in my opinion, um, if you are not on social media or you do less social media than others, it will not hurt your career. In fact, it might help. Yeah. So, and I was like, uh, my niece, she's scared straight. She does not have any social media, which I'm like, don't you kind of miss it? And she, and she really doesn't, but and I don't want to be a stick in the mud and say, nobody can do anything. But if you notice, like for me, I post pictures of my dog and I enjoy it and I promote some of my things going on, but I don't comment on much, I, I'll maybe make a joke uh, every once in a while, but I'm, ca I'm careful too, but only because I'm thinking like, so what do I want to achieve? And if saying something is not going to get me to what I want to achieve, then I'll just, I'll just tell my husband. Um, I don't have to, have to put it out there. I don't want to fight all the time. Some people do, some people love it. Uh, and that's great for them. But just like, like for you, I would, I, would, I would read that book. Uh, just take some time and look at Peggy Noonan's book. Um, and just think about all the great opportunities that you have to work there. And, and also ask, like, what's the worst that could happen? Really ask yourself, like, what, what, as what President Bush asked me, what's the worst that could happen? You're an educated woman in America. You'll be fine. Yep. Thank you. 
And uh, Paulina, one other thing I just wanted to say that Dana's former colleague, Tony uh, Prado, once said something that made me laugh. It's actually on Twitter of all places. He said that someone asked him what um, existed 20 years ago that, that didn't exist now. And there were a lot of people who said, oh, you know, we have home phones and rotary phones. And his, his response was the unexpressed thought. Um, and it made me laugh. Um, and to Dana's point, You've got your friends, people you agree with. We don't need to express everything. And that's, you know, that's a good place to be. So, you know, just the good piece of advice from Tony. Um, I think we have Lucy who is next. Hey, Lucy. Hi, Dana. Thanks so much for taking the time to do this. Really appreciate yeah. it. Um, so my question is, was there ever a time in your life where you felt like you weren't moving forward in your career or in other parts of your life. And what did you do to change that? Yes, a lot, <laughs> a lot. Um, there, there, I, I think that my, um, the two issues I was having when I was like 24, 25, I, which I call the quarter life crisis, were that um, one, I felt like I had, learned all I could in the job that I had. Although looking back, I'm like, who was I kidding? Uh, of course you can always improve, but um, I was ready to move up, but I didn't really love who was in leadership at the time. Uh, and so I was sort of thinking, I'm like, but also do I want to live in Washington the rest of my life? And I hadn't really had a chance to travel anywhere. And I was thinking like, wait, 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 what am I doing? Am I, have I made some bad decisions about career choice, et cetera? And then the other thing was like, I had not been on a date in a long time. And I was like, how does anyone meet anybody here in Washington? And this is before obviously online dating and all of those things. I just didn't, I, I just didn't meet anybody. And I was like, well, all these ideas that I had of what was gonna happen in my life are not happening. So I just was uh, lost and I, I, I was part of a church group at, um, it's called Church of the Reformation. It's a Lutheran church that's right behind the Supreme Court. And I was part of the singles group there. And we would get together every Wednesday night for a little potluck supper. And, you know, we would go around the table, talk about things that were going on. And I talked about this thing. I'm like, I'm like I just feel lost. I'm not sure, like, what am I doing? And uh, a woman that was part of our group, she was a little bit older than us. She said, remember uh, what God says, uh, fear not. Like you are not forgotten. Like you're not, he's, he's not going to just like forget about you. Like things are going to happen. This is a strange time in your life. You don't get through it. So anyway, I, I ended up kind of taking that to heart. And two months later, I get on this plane and I sit next to this guy with a British accent and no wedding ring. And we talked for two and a half hours and we're landing in Chicago. I'm like, Oh wait, Lord, I know I asked you to help me find somebody, but, uh, he is, lives in England and he's older than me and he might be an ex murderer. And did I mention he lives in England? Um, but I was in love and I took this huge chance. And um, eight months later, I moved to England and we've been together 24 years. And, you know, I, I, that was a big change because I was leaving also my career. I thought, well, how am I ever going to come? Who will ever remember me? We didn't have social media back at the t in, in those days. And so one of the things I did was I did this old fashioned thing where I would send postcards to five people a week. And one of them was Mindy Tucker, who I mentioned before. So she worked on Capitol Hill when I did. And then she was working on the Bush campaign. And then she was working at the Justice Department for John Ashcroft when 9-11 happened. And she called me, Peter and I had now moved to San Diego, and she called me and said, would you still be willing to move to DC? I need another spokesperson on my team. And I was packing as she was talking and my whole life changed. So um, I would just say this, I guarantee that you are doing everything that you need to do right now to set yourself up for success. It is hard to be patient, um, but you have an exceedingly bright future. You're part of this program. You're here in America. We are headed into a time where the economy is gonna do better. You are not gonna be on Zoom for the rest of your life. I promise you that you are gonna get out of those dorm rooms and those apartments and you're gonna be in an office. You're gonna be back at the bars. And 
I'm actually very excited for what your generation is going to do. And we, we, we need you. We need all of your creativity and your passion and your ideas. It's, um, it's an exciting time to see what you're going to do. And that's why I wrote the book. Really, I, I want you to feel better about what's coming. And I can't tell you what exactly that's going to be. But Lucy, I hope that, you know, in, in five years or so, uh, maybe you'll get in touch with me and let me know how it all turned out. Thank you. We're going to begin to wrap up. Um, one of the questions I, I want to make sure I ask, especially for those, those of you who have the book at home, um, is tell us your favorite chapter and what you think your best piece of advice is in the book and the thing you want to make sure you, you relay the most to our audience and, and the world through your book. Oh, my favorite chapter. Um, actually, I actually want to tell you, can I, it's not a chapter, it's the introduction. Of course. So in the introduction, I talk about this young woman who came, called me from Washington, DC. She was concerned because the congressional office she worked for wanted her to issue a statement in her name that she thought was like nuts and ridiculous and like a terrible tone and unproductive. And she thought it would actually hurt her in the long run. So I said, well, don't, don't say it. And she was worried that if she didn't say it, she would either get fired or maybe shunned by her office and uh, she said, I don't think I can say no because I'm not Dana Perino. And I said, well, how do you think I became Dana Perino? And my point of that story is that your personal integrity is the, your most valuable asset and you have to protect it at all costs. When I was writing the book, and when you do a book, there's an editor and there's blah, blah, blah like, you know, there's people that are looking at the book and commenting on it as you send in drafts. And three guys involved in the project suggested that I remove that story from the book because they thought it sounded arrogant. And I, so I, I was like, oh, arrogant. Well, that's like the worst thing. I'm like, I'm born in Wyoming. Like, don't I, that's like the worst thing you call me. So I slept on it and I woke up and I'm like, wait a minute, that's bullshit. This is what this, this is why I wrote the book. This is the, this is the, what are you talking about? It sounds arrogant. Would you say that to a guy? If a guy wrote a, a management book and he started with a book like that, how do you think I became Mr. Tom Jones? You think like, like, that's arrogant and tell him to take it out? So anyway, uh, I just thought that that was kind of interesting and um, it sort of became my favorite story in the book. Um, I, I love the serenity chapter. Um, there's lots of practical advice about your day-to-day -day work life and how to become a better writer, how to become a better crisis communicator or a leader. But the serenity chapter, I think, is my favorite because it's really the payoff of everything. Um, you can read a lot of career books that can tell you how to do X, Y, or Z better at the office or to climb that ladder. But there, I don't think there's really a modern how-to guide to do all of those things and also still find a way to find serenity in your life. Um, so I think that would probably be my favorite. So we've got one final question from Grace, but um, once you've answered Grace's question, since uh, I'm a British heritage born in that funny island, um, I was also wondering what your favorite British food is, but Grace, you should ask your question first. Okay, okay. Um, thank you again um, for being here and taking the time out of your very busy schedule to I know. chat with did us. I, did I stress that enough? <laughs> Um, it's an important point. Um, so I wanted to ask, looking back at your career thus far, do you recall a particular day that was particularly challenging? Um, and what were some of the qualities that you think helped you push through it? Um, I know everybody likes to throw around the word grit. Um, but what do you think were some of the things that, that really pushed you through? And then on the flip side, on a more positive note, what do you consider to be your greatest professional achievement so far? Um, Gosh, there were so many, like I got, I was the only one that got hurt in the whole time uh, when the president had shoes thrown at him in Iraq. I ended up with a black eye because of those boom, on, the, the, arm, the steel arm of the boom mic swung around and hit me right in the face. And uh, that was a, a challenging day. Um, um, I'm going to tell you one that ended up kind of being funny, um, funny now. So I was like the third day as deputy press secretary uh, in January of 05, the communications director asked me if I could sit in and staff an interview that the president was going to do with a columnist. It was a foreign policy issue dealing with Iran. And all I had to do 
was come to the pre-brief where the communications director would meet me in the Oval Office, and then he was going to brief the president, and then all I had to do was sit in with the interview and cut off the interview at 30 minutes. I'm like, okay, I can do that and take notes. <clears throat> well, we get to the Oval Office. It's uh, my second time being in there. I don't even know if the president remembered my name. And Dan says, okay, Mr. President, you're going to do this interview with this columnist. And he says, what? I'm not doing an interview. It's like, yes, remember, Mr. President, you said that you would do the interview. I was like, no. I said I would talk to him. I did not say I would do an interview with him. Because if I do an interview with him, it's going to look like I'm negotiating with Iran through him. And I'm not going to do that. And therefore, she doesn't need to be here. And then he looked at me and went, like, see yourself out. And I was dying, like melting inside. I wanted to like crawl under the covers and never come back out. So the press secretary's office is really close to the Oval Office. So I walked 32 steps to my office and I closed the um, pocket door behind me. I just had a little cubicle and I called my husband. And I said, um, told him what happened. I was tearful. And he said, well, just think for the rest of your life, you can say, I've been kicked out of better places than this. So that was in 05. And in 2010, I was doing the president's book tour and we're on the plane. And I'm just looking for things to talk about with him. And I said, sir, do you remember when you kicked me out of the Oval Office? He said, I never kicked you out of the Oval Office. I said, no, 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 you didn't remember. And Dan was there and then I was wearing this outfit and then you said this and you were standing here. And then he said, that. and I, re I literally remember Grace every single moment of that day. And he's like, I have no recollection of this at all. And then he said, are you still upset? And I was like, yes. And he said, you know, why don't you learn to let it go? But that's taken me a while. You know, I mean, you talk about um, grit is actually, it's a, it's a great question. Um, uh, I, I, I think that it just grows over time. And especially when you're in an in a environment where you have a president who's making, you know, a, a president's job is just to make decisions all day long. And that's grit. What I did was a lot of work, right? And, but I, I think that over time, you just learn to sort of build up a, a thicker skin a, along the way. And when you ask me about my biggest professional achievement, I mean, obviously becoming the White House press secretary, that's the top of the field. And I would say that, but I think I would go make it a little bit broader and talk about that introduction of the book again. Um, at the end of your day, and at the end of your career, you wanna be able to look yourself in the mirror and like what you see. You know if you are not being uh, full of integrity or grace or dignity, like you know it in your gut and that's a terrible, terrible feeling. So if you can find ways to suppress those moments and to live with more integrity, that's the professional achievement. And at the, I also say in the book, you know, instead of thinking about what people will say at your funeral, even though I think that's a worthwhile exercise to think about, um, what will they say at your retirement party? You know, will they help you? <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> Peter said, what will they say about you behind your back? Okay, well, that would be good, but I don't know if we're gonna, we're gonna find that. That's British humor for you. That is British humor. But integrity, Grace, that's what I would say. Okay, favorite British food? since Peter is there. Does anyone have a favorite British food? Yes. Do yeah. you have a favorite British food? Come on, Peter, join the conversation for one second. Okay, probably, uh, come on. disgusting uh, fish come and on. chips. Fish and hello. chips. Say hi yeah, to everybody. Hello. What is sticky toffee pudding, Peter? It's what it says. It's pudding uh, as in sponge mm. with toffee in it, which is very sticky. It's very sweet I and so it wish. is absolutely delicious. Um, <laughs> Karen, you can feel your arteries firing up as you eat it. Okay, come on. Okay, uh, up, up. okay. Right. this is who really wanted to be Jasper's on the show tonight. Yeah, he's always got to be part of it. So uh, Also get a dog, that's the other advice. Yeah, British food is fine very occasionally. So sticky to toffee pudding is wonderful once every few years. Fish and chips is great every couple of years if I visit the UK. I would say if year. I didn't have to worry about calories, I would eat hobno chocolate hobnobs every day. See, another delicious, fine British delicacy is a hobnob. Yes. 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 You can all Google those. 
Thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate the conversation. Paulette, Antonio, thank you. And thank you, Mo and Grace. You did a great job. Great to meet you and chat about advice. Jasper, Jasper. want to say hi? There he is. <laughs> Well, thanks everyone for being here. Geopolitics has several forum events as the semester is wrapping up tomorrow night. Join Geopolitics for combating hate and extremism online on Monday night for conversations with House Republican Conference Chair Congresswoman Liz Cheney and Tuesday night for a conversation on protecting election integrity with Chris Krebs. Information on all these events can be found on Geopolitics social media accounts. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Dana. Thank thanks you. Thank you both. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.